Saving Faith by John Cahoon Chapter 1 Of Faith in General Faith in the general acceptance of the term properly signifies an assent of the mind to the truth of a report or testimony upon the authority of another or such a persuasion of the veracity of one's testimony or promise as determines the mind to trust to it. And it is in Scripture opposed to doubting. Matthew 24, 31 Here it will be proper to observe 1. Faith, so far as it respects divine truths, is of four, four sorts. First, a historic faith is mentioned in Scripture. This faith is a bare assent of the mind to the truth of what is revealed in the Word of God, while the man who thus believes neither loves nor regards nor applies to himself the truths therein revealed. He may have clear speculative notions of all the doctrines of Scripture and be able to illustrate and defend them in an, in an unexceptional manner, and yet all this knowledge leaves his heart without the smallest suitable impression either of the truth or importance or design of them. His study of them is only the exercise of natural reason and is in order to gratify his curiosity and to increase his degree of knowledge. In this historic faith of divine truths, there may be a firmer assent than is commonly given to the truth of any human history, which may be a reason why many mistake it for a saving assent. Such a faith as that may be found in wicked men. See John 2:23-25. Acts 8 verse 13, and even in devils, Mark 1 24, James 2 19. Second, we read in scripture also of a temporary faith. By this faith, a man with some degree of natural affection receives the truths of the gospel as both certain and good. But, as they have never been rooted in his heart, he soon afterwards loses all the impression of them and in time of temptation falls away. Such is the faith of those hearers of the gospel who in the parable of the sower are compared to stony ground. Matthew 13, 20-21 Their assent to the truth of the gospel is accompanied by some slight and transient flashes of joy, by some hasty resolutions to, con to reform their conduct, and by an external reformation especially from gross sins, 2 Peter 2.10. Their faith is called temporary because, having no root in themselves, they endure only for a while. The faith of these believers rests either upon the testimony of them who preach the word or upon human arguments for the truth of it, and their joy commonly arises from a notion that their happiness will be secured by what they hear. The difference between this and historic faith is that historic faith does not influence the affections, at least not the affection of joy. For though the devils tremble, yet they never rejoice. Whereas a temporary faith reaches the affections and makes a man either tremble at the threatening of the law or rejoice in the promises of the gospel. Third, the faith of miracles is often mentioned in the New Testament, and it was an extraordinary gift by which a man, by means of a divine impression on his mind, believed that God would work something that would be far above the power of natural cause, either by him or upon him. Faith to remove mountains is of the former sort, 1 Corinthians 13, 2, and faith to be healed is of the latter. Acts 14, verse 9. God bestowed this faith only on special occasions, either for the confirmation of some extraordinary mission or of some important article of revealed truth. It was for these purposes that miracles were wrought by Moses under the Old Testament and by Christ and his apostles under the New. 
the ground as well as the means of that faith was an immediate suggestion from God, and of this divine suggestion they had as full an assurance as one can have of the reality of any object that he sees with his eyes. The faith of miracles in the days of Christ and his apostles was bestowed on some who were not in a state of salvation. See Matthew 7, 22-23 Persons may sink into hell with this kind of faith and may go to heaven without it. It cannot avail a sinner anything for salvation, for it is not a trusting in Jesus as a Savior from sin and wrath. Fourth, we read in Scripture also of a saving and justifying faith. This is that precious faith by which we cordially assent to all the truths concerning Jesus Christ and trust in Him alone for all His salvation. It is usually called saving faith because in whomever it is implanted, there salvation is begun that will in due time be consummated. John 3.36 And it is sometimes called justifying faith because it is a believing with application, the gift of Christ's righteousness, and a relying on that consummate righteousness only for all our security from eternal death and all our title to eternal life. And because it is the instrument of justification before God, Galatians 2.16, by this living faith, the believing sinner is vitally united to Christ as his covenant head and surety, and he becomes personally interested in his righteousness and salvation. This faith differs not only in degree, but even in nature or kind from the counterfeits already mentioned. John 6, 64 through 65. Saving faith is implanted and increased in the heart of an elect sinner by the Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit, in regenerating the dead sinner, implants a living faith together with all other graces in his soul. Hence, the blessed Spirit is called the Spirit of Faith, 2 Corinthians 4, 13, and faith is called the gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and the faith of the operation of God Colossians 2:12 because faith is the gift of God freely bestowed on a sinner who has no antecedent worth no good qualification to recommend him to divine favor it is usually called a grace a grace of the spirit and a saving grace it is also called a divine a supernatural a living and a holy faith. This faith is a living principle, and the dead sinner cannot exercise it until he is quickened by the Spirit to newness of life. It is a holy faith, and therefore no man can begin to be active in it until he is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. John 1 verse 13 A man cannot cordially believe the record of God unless he knows the true meaning of it, and spiritually discerns the authority and truth of it. Quote, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 It is necessary, then, that the Holy Spirit enlighten the eyes of his understanding so that he may discern the true meaning, authority, and veracity of the divine testimony in order to his cordial reception of it. Hence, true believers are said to have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that they might know the things that are freely given to them of God. 1 Corinthians 2.12 Saving faith is said to be of the operation of God who has raised Christ from the dead, to intimate that the same infinite power that raised up Jesus is necessary to quicken the dead sinner, to live by the faith of him. The sinner will neither relish or receive the truths of the gospel unless the Spirit convinces him of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, and unless he opens his heart and brings home the gospel to his mind and conscience, not in word only, but also in power, and in much assurance. 
the carnal mind is enmity to God and to the device of salvation by Jesus Christ. Therefore, the sinner is neither able nor willing to trust in Christ for his soul's salvation unless the Spirit, by his almighty energy, slays his enmity and removes his aversion. But to elect sinners it is given on behalf of Christ to believe in his name. The Spirit of God not only implants but preserves and increases faith in the hearts of the elect. He continues to work in them all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. And the higher the believer advances in the habit and exercise of this faith, the more sensible he is that he cannot exercise it, even in the lowest degree, unless the Holy Spirit enables him. 3. Saving faith is a real persuasion or belief of the revealed truths of God concerning Christ, and a cordial trust in Christ and in God through him, for all his salvation, or as the Apostle describes it, it is the substance or confidence of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 verse 1 True faith, according to the inspired Apostle, is the evidence of things not seen. It is the evidence of things not seen in order to its being the substance of things hoped for. It is an ascent of the mind illuminated by the Holy Spirit to the truth of all that God has revealed in his word, especially to the truth of his testimony concerning Jesus Christ and salvation by him. Saving faith is not a common or natural, but a divine and supernatural persuasion of the truth that God is, has testified respecting his Son and salvation by him, and that with particular application to the man himself. This persuasion though most reasonable in itself, yet is not founded on rational arguments for the authenticity of sacred scripture, but on the divine testimony alone, as spiritually discerned by an enlightened mind in the scripture itself. 1 John 5, 9-10 To believe with the heart the word of Christ is to give credit to it on the ground of the divine testimony perceived in it. Understanding spiritually the meaning of the truths recording it, recorded in Scripture and perceiving the divine authority of those truths upon their consciences. True believers assent cordially to the truth of God's Word because He has testified it and because His authority is interposed in it. They receive it not as the Word of man, but as the Word of God. They are persuaded of the truth of divine testimony and their belief or persuasion of the truth of it is grounded in their knowledge of that truth. The testimony of God is not believed until the mind is enlightened in the knowledge of it and the heart is persuaded of the certainty of it. To believe the divine record is the effect of its being presented by the Spirit of Christ to the mind in its true meaning and divine authority. When the Spirit demonstrates it, Thus, to the conscience, the mind assents to the truth of it, and so receives the holy image of the Son of God speaking by it. And since the offers and invitations of the gospel addressed to sinners indefinitely form a leading part of that record, every man who assents cordially to the truth of it in all its parts believes it with application to himself. He believes that the record in general refers to him as a sinner of mankind and that the offers, invitations, and absolute promises in it are all directed to him. Now this assent, according to our apostle, is the evidence of things not seen. When a man is persuaded of the truth of divine doctrines and promises because God has revealed and testified them, his faith is the evidence or conviction or demonstration of things not seen. The things of which he is persuaded are not indeed seen with the eyes of his body, but the truth of them is as evident to the eyes of his mind, and as he is as much convinced of the certainty of them as he is of the reality of that object, 
that he sees evidently with his bodily eyes. Although they are not yet matters of sense or experience to him, still, being present to the eye of his faith, he reckons upon them as the greatest realities. His faith is such a convincing evidence or demonstration of the reality of these invisible things as carries with it an answer to all the objections of remaining unbelief. Moreover, faith, according to the Apostle, is also the substance, or rather, as the original word is rendered on the margin, the confidence of things hoped for. In the scriptures, divine things are proposed to our understanding as object, as objects that are infallibly certain, to the truth of which we are to yield a firm assent. They, or at least many of them, are at the same time exhibited to our will and affections, or for our possession and enjoyment as blessings of salvation to be hoped for. As proposed to our understanding, they are held forth as realities to be firmly assented to, as exhibited for our enjoyment. They are represented as good things promised, and therefore as objects of hope. In the exercise of faith, a man apprehends the good things tendered and promised to him in the gospel as being his in offer and in right to take possession of them. For he cannot warrantably hope for them otherwise than as his own. In believing the record of God with application to himself, he not only believes that Christ with his righteousness and salvation is freely offered to him in particular, but he also believes that the absolute promises of the new covenant are in and with Christ, offered or directed and offered to him for his acceptance, and that the gracious offer affords him a full right so to rely on them as to take possession of the blessings promised, and to hope for the complete enjoyment of them. Now faith, considered in its relation to the things of God presented in the gospel for a man's enjoyment, is the substance or confidence of things hoped for. It is, as the Dutch translators render the original word in the margin, a firm confidence of those things. It is a firm confidence of or concerning them, a firm trust or confidence in Jesus Christ and in God through him for all those blessings of grace and glory. When a man believes in the Lord Jesus, he places a firm and unsuspecting confidence in him for the whole of his salvation. Upon the warrant of the gospel offer and promise as directed to him, he cordially trusts that Christ loves and saves him from sin and hell, and that he will save him with an everlasting salvation as the faithful Redeemer, in relying on his surety righteousness alone for all his title to it. He places the confidence of his heart in him. He trusts that he will save or do the part of a Savior to him in particular. He not only believes Christ, but he trusts or believes in him, whilst he assents to the truth of the divine record that God gives to him eternal life in offer, he, upon the warrant of that authentic offer, trusts that he gives it to him in possession, or he believes that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ he shall be saved. Acts 15 verse 11 this confidence is the substance or subs subsistence in his mind of things hoped for. It is the means or instrument of their having a real substance, subsistence in his soul, considered as things that are absent and future, and in hope only they have no real subsistence of their own in his soul, as being not present in it, but his faith or confidence in Christ for them becomes the subsistence of them. It is not, indeed, the subsistence of them in perfect fruition, for they are yet unseen and hoped for, but it is the subsistence of them in begun or progressive enjoyment. That this confidence or affiance of the heart in the Lord Jesus for all the good things of the promise is as essential a part of saving faith as a cordial assent to the truth of the divine record is will be shown afterwards. 4. 
there is a very great difference between saving faith and any other sort of faith. Saving faith is a divine, a supernatural, a living, and a holy faith, and therefore it must be altogether different from a human, a natural, a dead, or a common faith. Although a saving faith may be illustrated by stating a comparison between it and a common faith, yet there is a great difference between it and this faith. It differs not only in its grounds, its principles, its objects, and the manner of its exercise, but in its very nature from every sort of faith that is exercised by unregenerate men. Many unregenerate persons have acquired much knowledge of divine things, but none of them has the smallest measure of saving and supernatural knowledge. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Of true believers and that of natural men, why should there not be the same difference between the faith of the former and that of the latter? We read in the scripture of men who believed and yet had no acquaintance with true faith. Simon the sorcerer believed, Agrippa believed, the hearers compared to the stony ground believed, and many believed in the name of Jesus when they saw the miracles that he did. But he did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men. John 2, 24 It does not, however, appear that any of these had the smallest degree of saving faith. The difference does not lie in the degree of faith, as if saving faith were no more than a higher degree of natural or common faith. For we read of some believers, of some true believers whose faith was weak while yet it was saving. Matthew 8.26 Although in the scripture a high degree of faith is enjoined, yet a low degree of it is never represented as counterfeit. The Apostle John informs us that whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. 1 John 5 verse 1 Here he declares that believing is a mark or evidence of regeneration. But if a certain degree of assent is meant, and yet that degree is nowhere fixed in Scripture, as is indeed the case, the new birth can never be evidenced by believing. Besides, devils have faith and have it doubtless in a very high degree, and yet their belief is far from being of a saving kind. In a word, the descriptions of saving faith given in the oracles of truth are such as show plainly that it differs in kind from all natural and common faith. It is there called the faith of the operation of God, Colossians 2.12, faith unfeigned, 1 Timothy 1.5, precious faith, 2 Peter 2 verse 1, the faith of God's elect, Titus 1 verse 1, a faith that is peculiar to them or is the gift, the peculiar gift of God to them, and such a faith as is not only a believing in a lower or higher degree, but a believing with the heart unto righteousness. See Romans 10 verse 10. It is distinguished also from a dead faith that produces no fruits. James 2, 17 through 20. And it is a faith that purifies the heart, works by love, and overcomes the world. 5. True faith is required in the law and promised in the gospel. It is therefore both a duty and a privilege. The same God both requires and promises unfeigned faith. It is required in the moral law. In the law, as a covenant of works, unregenerate sinners who hear the gospel are commanded to begin believing in Jesus Christ. And in the law, as a rule of duty, saints are enjoyed, enjoined to advance the exercise of believing in him. The law of the Lord is perfect, requiring the utmost perfection of every duty. Larger Catechism, Question 99 And if so, then it requires faith, and the utmost perfection of faith, as well as of every other duty. The first commandment of the moral law, which is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, Exodus 20, verse 3, requires every sinner to believe in Jehovah the Son, and so to know and acknowledge him to be his redeeming God. In the following passages, 
both sinners and saints are more expressly commanded to believe or trust in him as mediator and in God through him. Judgment is before him, therefore trust thou in him. Job 35 verse 14 Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Proverbs 3 verse 5 Trust in him at all times, ye people. Psalm 62 verse 8 Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Psalms 37 verse 5 Trust ye in the Lord forever. Isaiah 26 verse 4 Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Isaiah 45 22 Let him trust in the name of the Lord, and stay upon his God. Isaiah 50 verse, verse 10 Incline your ear, and come unto me, here and your soul shall live. Isaiah 55 verse 3 While ye have the light, believe in the light. John 12 36 Ye believe in God, believe also in me. John 14 1 Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16.31 And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 3, verse 23 This is his commandment, his commandment by way of eminence, his great commandment, which is fundamental to and comprehensive of every other divine command. This is the express the positive, the peremptory command of God the Father that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. It is not said that he only advises or barely allows, but he commands sinners of mankind in common to believe or trust in the name of his Son. They are not only invited and entreated, but expressly commanded to believe in the Lord Jesus, and so to take possession of him and of his whole salvation. Oh, how great, how good, how inexpressibly gracious is this command. Reader, be assured that it is not your sin, but your duty to trust cordially in the compassionate Savior for all his salvation, for you are expressly commanded to do it. You never begin to yield a sincere obedience to any other divine command till you begin to obey this one. And it is in proportion as you observe this one that your obedience to the rest is holy and acceptable to God. Never be discouraged from attempting present obedience to it, because you are of yourself utterly unable. For saving faith is graciously promised in the gospel, as a part of salvation, and also as the instrument, according to the new covenant, of receiving higher degrees of salvation. It is freely promised in the gospel. It is therefore not only a duty, but a grace, a benefit, an inestimable privilege. The promises of it are absolute promises. I shall mention some of them. The outcasts and they that are ready to, they that are ready, perish shall come. Isaiah 27 verse 13. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. Isaiah 45, 24 I said, Thou shalt say, Thou shalt call me my father, and shalt not turn away from me. Jeremiah 3, verse 19 And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ish Ishi, that is, my husband. Hosea 2, 16 I will say to them who are not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Hosea 2.23 I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Zephaniah 3.12 And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Matthew 12.21 These, with all the other promises of the covenant of grace, made to the elect in Christ, their covenant head, are yea and amen in him. And in and with him they are offered to sinners in common who hear the gospel. They are left or directed in offer to sinners indefinitely for their acceptance. And therefore, when an awakened sinner believes with application to himself, 
the offer of Christ and trust in him, he should at the same time believe with application to himself the offer of those promises and rely on them. When he feels his inability to believe cordially in Christ or desires the increase of his faith, he ought to apply and trust and plead those promises of faith in order to advance in the habit and exercise of it.